Welcome to episode 14 of the Gamer's Tavern. This is part 2 of our 40th anniversary tribute to Dungeons and Dragons Edition Wars. In this episode we talk about the Wizards of the Coast era of Dungeons and Dragons and of course Pathfinder, D&D Next and the old school Renaissance. Now, I really want to point out at this point in time we intended originally to record our Edition Wars episode as one episode, but there was just so much to cover that Ross and I talked for well over three hours, and it would have been way too long of a podcast, so we ended up splitting it right down the middle, and this is the second half. So this was actually recorded, I think it was a month ago or more so some of the information in terms of the newest information is out of date uh so there's a couple of things i want to bring up first number one i talk about making sure you sign up for the dungeons and dragons next play test it was an open play test the wizards of the coast ran for well over a year getting player feedback as they refined the core edition that open playtest is now closed. So if you didn't get your copy of the playtest packet, there is no legal way to get it at this point in time unless you contact Wizards of the Coast and try to get in on their closed playtest. I absolutely have no idea how you would do that because I haven't tried it yet. One other thing I would like to bring up is we keep talking about the nebulous future of when the newest edition of D&D will come out. Since this was recorded, Wizards announced that the new edition will be launched sometime in the summer of 2014. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I had a rumor stuck in my throat there. Anyway, I, I also feel I should point out because this episode was so long and since, you know, I own the Gamers Tavern and I don't really have to worry about, you know, last calls and the Queen's Guards and everything, um, I kind of got into my personal stores a little bit. So if I'm a little bit slurry and the conversation a little bit disjunted, I, 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 I got a little ranty. Um, <laughs> but that, that's completely my fault and I apologize for that if it bothers you, but... Frankly, I kind of think listening to me ranting is fun because I go off. Anyway, I, I really hope you enjoy the episode. We spent a lot of time going to a lot of detail on the Wizards of the Coast era because it is the era that both Ross and I know very well from having lived through it, both professionally and personally in gaming, the professional being, of course, Ross. But I, I really hope you enjoy it, so go ahead and grab a drink from the bar and take a seat, and um, yeah, I know it's after last call, but I won't tell the Queen's card if you don't. And we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Have you been looking for a dark fantasy RPG setting? Are you interested in seeing a new take on the action horror genre? Then you should check out Accursed. Accursed is a setting for the Savage Worlds RPG created by me, Ross Watson, and my good friends Jason Marker and John Dunn. It is a world where the heroes are monsters who fight for redemption against the witches who have conquered their land. To find out more about Accursed, search for Accursed on drivethroughrpg.com. Accursed is now on sale there and in many other fine retailers for gaming PDFs. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy Accursed. So that is going to take us out of second edition, going to take us out of the Lorraine Williams and into the Watsi and into... And then they brought in third edition, which is where I come in as an actual player. And reason why I started coming in in third edition was because of the major overhaul on the rules in terms of second edition had Thaco. First edition had the two hit tables. I could never understand those as a kid. This is... Is it 1999 or 2000? Somewhere 2000. in that era. Yeah. I am 20 years old. I am now able to understand this shit. But it's now presented in a format where, okay, here's the AC. The AC is the number you have to roll with your plus hit bonus to hit. And I'm like, that makes perfect sense. And I want to go on record and say that I've listened to an interview with Steve Winters, who was one of the people behind the transition from first to second edition. And he has gone on record as saying, 
yeah, do you really think flipping AC was a new opinion, was a new option to us? We considered that, but we thought we would break D and D and completely alienate the fan base. If we started having positive AC counting up from 10, I'm not bow mouthing TSR by saying that wizards of the coast rules setting at this point in time for me, hit the right buttons. Well, I've heard, again, from very close sources, I've heard that 3rd edition was underway at TSR. And that... Oh, yeah, they, they, they've was, been working on this for a while. And this many, started many, with two, right. with the quote-unquote 2.5, the 2nd edition well, revised. Okay, let's... The, the, the What I want to say here about that is I believe 3rd edition started being designed under TSR and was completed, maybe refined a bit, by the Watsi team. And I will not question those because my sources say the same thing. Okay. And I want to put something out like early on because full disclosure should apply here. I got my start in the gaming industry as a writer, as a game designer, working on 3rd edition compatible products. And I actually have my name in some 3rd edition books, 3.5 edition books. Um, So definitely take my opinions about 3rd edition with a grain of salt because as a creator, I have a stake in in that that I don't have with any other edition of Dungeons And Dragons. I want to say so. this right now. A lot of our guests and a lot of people in the industry to this day, the biggest names in this industry started publishing for Green Ronin and other people that were publishing under OGL. We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. But first I want to talk about the major rules changes. Yeah. For and, one and thing, like I said, this is what really clicked to me was the flip of AC. Starting at 10 and going up instead of starting at 10 and going down. And everybody has the same experience point chart. That, for me, was huge. I love that. Yeah, that was a big difference, which that's something we didn't touch on in basic was... The Different f- experience point charts, yeah. Well, not the difference about. experience point charts, necessarily, but how you got experience. And well, that it yeah. was based on gold gold pieces you stole, as opposed <laughs> to... Yeah. Or well, stole or liberated or we, whatever method you choose yeah, to describe it, but there's a lot of things we skimmed over. We didn't mention collars or any of that other stuff or Yeah, but stuff. that that's one thing. But this was also a major shift in terms of the rule setting when it comes to how rules are defined. A lot of third edition and three point five that followed it, which was the they called it a new edition. I call it an errata on crack. <laughs> But it was basically a major shift. This is where I call the genre shift in Dungeons and Dragons. Basic first and second edition were in the adventure genre. Indiana Jones, uh, Gunga Den, the old school, digging through something to find something to lead you to something else and blah, blah, blah. Starting with third edition and cementing with fourth edition was the genre shift to action where combat was the major focus. I will not argue against that. The fight scenes started to get a lot more prevalence, starting with 3rd edition Well, let's I mean, let's, let's talk about one really important factor here, is that 3rd edition was probably the first edition to be designed. Although Dungeons Dragons started out as a miniature game, it didn't really have rules specific to miniatures well, uh, as part of the core until 3rd edition. Basic... D&D still gave measurements in inches. Well, yes, that but got that's... shifted away in thir- in first edition. What I'm saying is is that it wasn't really a core part of the game to have miniatures on the table to the until point where third edition. This is an argument I get into constantly online, but I really feel that from in third and fourth edition and Pathfinder, it is almost impossible to run combat without some sort of miniatures or tokens or something to well, represent okay. where everyone is. I okay, I, I can I can refute that it is not it is impossible. We've we've played a lot almost of almost impossible. Almost. <laughs> well all right. An experienced gamer like let, yourself let's, can pull it let off. Let me try it and define this a little bit better. I think <laughs> the game is intended to be run with miniatures and a map. And I think the rules work best when they have that kind of level of granularity, when you have a model and you can count exactly how many feet I am away from Now, 3rd edition wasn't as bad as the, at, at, at this. It was a lot more focused on... It was a lot more gelled in terms of combat. 3.5 is when they really made the shift to... If you're not experienced in doing 
theater of the mind combat, you really can't run combat in this game. Yeah, I, I want to say 3.5 is the strong divide between those two. Specifically. I don't know about that, um, but third so edition it really comes in handy. We we can agree you can we can agree it. that this was the shift between not needing it and you probably need it. Yeah, let's let's say that we can agree on that. Oh, no question whatsoever. So we, about we can that. we can agree that battle mats and miniatures became damn near necessary. I, I you're almost impossible is probably the best way to put it, but. And, and the only reason I don't like that is because I did have a lot of experience where we didn't need them. But again, that's just maybe my own personal style and experience. There's so many rules that have to do with the map, and have to do with how far away I am from somebody, and and flanking and, the five foot step, and so well, on and so forth. There were class features that were, you know, about miniatures and moving miniatures on the map, like the extra speed a, a barbarian got or a monk. You know, or and ha- if you want, having... if you want to break into a little bit more, the samurai who sure. got a five foot step between their uh, cleaves. Well, okay, but the, the point, the point being is that there were a lot of class features even in the core book that required didn't well maybe not require, but were very heavily leaning towards having a map and having guys on that map. So that that's a, that's an important thing to talk about from a system point of view. I I think third edition was very accessible. It was very deep. Oh, it no offered, question about that. It, it offered you a lot of character depth. And I've talked about before how much I really enjoy a deep game when it comes to creating characters and, and being able to make different types of characters. And I think one of the biggest benefits of the system for 3rd Edition was how multi-classing was suddenly way more better. Um, and, and my concept was no longer tied directly to my class. You were no longer hamstrung if you wanted to split your classes one of my, or multi-class. Yeah, one of my first characters for D&D, and this is one of the reasons why I enjoyed so much with 3rd Edition, was that I was able to take a concept and build to meet that concept with the classes I chose, rather than say, okay, I'm a fighter, and that's my concept. I played a character who was a monster hunter, okay? And the very first class I took was Thief, and then followed that up with Fighter, and then followed that up with Barbarian, and then followed that into a prestige class, and I never felt like any one of those things defined me. It's, it's it was instead the fact that I was a monster hunter, and all the things that I chose, the abilities that I got out of my classes, that led me to that concept. So I th- I think the the rules overhaul in third edition was was in a lot of ways very very good, um, because it opened up for again that depth of character creation. It opened up a broader range of things you could do. And the skill system, I, I, I thought the skill system was probably the best we'd seen uh, of that non-combat abilities, um, you know, diplomacy and bluff and all those things that you could you could bring in. So there's that. Oh, yeah. Without a question, 3rd Edition did far better than any other system when it comes to doing stuff outside of combat in terms of, I want to do this. Okay, make a this roll. And that really, really, really helped out the system in a way. But one thing you brought up that really hurt the system, in my opinion, is the prestige classes. Well, and yeah, the feats. Yeah, you know, there. Well, there was. This actually is also part of part and parcel of the OGL because yes, if you just look at the straight, if you look at nothing else except the, the official Watsi releases. There were too many. I mean, we both can agree with that. There were too many oh, prestige classes. no question Too whatsoever. many feats. That's true. But if you look at the OGL, there were too many prestige classes and too many feats mere months after 3rd Edition came out. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, the thing about 3rd Edition, um, in, in terms of, like, there being a bloat of things, that is true, but that was going to be true anyway, just because of the OGL. I mean, uh, fr- frankly, you know, Watsi, I-, I-, I think it would have been a bad move for Watsi not to make prestige classes and feats, um, business wise, because the, other the people were already problem, doing it. The only problem I have from a game perspective is that how broken some of them were. Well, yeah. And it was obvious <laughs> when you looked at them from a mechanical point of view how bad some of them were in terms of design, where. It was obvious. Go after this prestige class if you're playing this because you're going to become a god by 12th level instead of 20th level. Well, yeah, I I can I can actually quote a really really broken prestige class right off the top of my head. 
it was, uh, I don't remember the actual title of it, but it was uh, for Eberron. And it was a Druid Prestige class. It was like Planeswalker or something like that. Um, Druid of the Planes. And you basically yeah. picked, what, one of the abilities is you picked one of the planes of Eberron. And you could then use your wild shape to transform into any creature native <laughs> to that plane. And get all of the abilities of one of those creatures native to that plane. Which meant that I could choose the plane that had Ifriti... Trans- use Wild Shape to turn into an Ifriti and then grant myself wishes. And that is the biggest problem, <laughs> mechanically speaking, from the 3.5 edition was the Druid class. So broken! Yeah, so well, bad. Druids, Druids I, I have argued this with, with some very good friends of mine who were deeply involved in the creation of 3rd edition. And I wrote a big blog post about it, too. But yeah, Druids are pretty much the most broken class and they're right out of the core book. It doesn't matter. Yes. Three o three o three five doesn't matter. Druids are to bomb, <laughs> and they don't need any magic items to do it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so yes, it's fair to say that third edition had its flaws, but it had some. It had some real highs and it had some lows. And I gotta say, the biggest high, well, for one thing, there was a lot of really, really, really good adventure de- design that was going on oh, third edition. Oh my. God, they had some good if adventures. If you want to start off right out of the bat with former guest Bruce Cordell and his, actually one of our first guests, Bruce Cordell, and his Sunless Citadel. I loved um, one called the uh, the Red Hand of Doom that by got Rich Baker. That, another former guest. Uh, no. Future, wait, future no, guest. Future guest, God hope. But... <laughs> Sorry, I was confusing him with the other guy who got his start in the same way. Uh, sorry, Keith Baker and Rich Bellew both rose to prominence in this time based off of something that grew out of the OGL. At this point in time, Wizards of the Coast had a competition to well, hang on, design we about a the campaign OGL setting. <laughs> this no, th- I'm I'm not getting to OGL yet, but okay, they they had a competition, the setting to design, design a, competition, yes. that thing they did. It was uh 2002, 2003, yeah. somewhere around it was there. 2002. Oh well, it actually, it's 2000. I want to say it's 2001. I, um, the reason uh, why I couldn't participate is my dad got hurt really bad, and I had to go home, take care of him in the hospital. I sent and, in an entry as my dumbass self, and. Yeah, no wonder I didn't make for, through the first round on that one. But. Well, I couldn't even I couldn't even try because I was so busy taking care of my dad. But um, but yeah, it thing, was. I want to say it was two thousand one. But anyway, the, yeah, there was this thing, and it was a big deal because they were going to pay. There, there was a prize for the the finalists, and then there was a grand prize, and the grand prize was going to be that Watsi would publish your setting as the next big D and D setting. Eberron. Eberron was the winner, um, but there were actually four finalists. They, they they were going to pick three, but they ended up with four. And the four yeah. finalists were Eberron was one, Morningstar was two, Dawnforge was three, and I can't remember the last one. But it was, I think it might have been Rich Bellew's one. Uh, uh, Rich, Rich Bellew. Not he Rich made, Bellew, he, he, but Rich. But yeah, the, the Order of the Stick guy. Yeah, that's Rich Bellew. Isn't it? I think we're mangling his last name. Okay. I will fix this in the edit. But, uh, yeah. Rich designed one of the finalists for that and he ended up if you're wondering who we're talking about if you've read order the stick burlu 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 yes i I thought we were mangling that sorry rich if you're listening to this we apologize it's burlu yes yeah he is a really awesome if you want to know how intricately he understands both how D D works and how to tweak fun at the system and you haven't read Order of the Stick yet? What the fuck is wrong with you? Go read Order of the Stick. It's one of the greatest webcomics ever. Uh, Order of the Stick is pretty awesome, and it is entirely a 3rd edition, 3.5 edition uh, They actually make a gag about that, about four or the five shift. strips in. The shift, the shift from 3rd to 3.5, <laughs> yep. yeah. And it's great. Uh, so let's, let's talk about the OGL. Oh, yeah. This is one of the things that, in my opinion, was... Both the greatest and worst things that happened to gaming in the history of gaming. Now, for best, I'm going to start with the positive. So many companies and so many people whose names you will recognize came out of this. Basically, OGL was them trying to cop on this uh, 
I don't even know if Creative Commons was out at the time yet, but they were trying to riff on the idea of open software development that was going on in the Linux community in terms of game design, where here is what you can publish in your books. You can build off this and do whatever you want. And it left out some key elements in terms of you couldn't do beholders, you couldn't do uh, mind flayers, you couldn't do level advancement, you couldn't do... And there were various things that they kept to themselves, but they released almost everything as open source, where you could build off it. It was huge because it allowed so many different companies to participate and add so many so much content, and it launched the RPG careers of so many people. Pretty much actually, everyone who is of, and again, I'm of my <laughs> generation and kind of Ross's generation, anyone you know in the gaming industry that's in their 30s pretty much got started in OGL. Well, it, it, it was really huge and really good and really bad at the same time. Um, it was good because there are companies like, well, Fantasy Flight Games would not be nearly as successful as it is today if it hadn't had um, that big boost from OGL and all the D20 books that they made, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Green Ronin would be not nearly as big as it was. They wouldn't exist, I right. think, there was, because the, there's, everything yeah. they did was OGL for all of the 90s, it seemed like. There was there were many game companies that are around today that would not that be, that grew out of it. But at the same time, it was a it was a, as I said um, early is that it did add to that bloat. I mean, if you started a 3.5 game, and somebody showed up to your table with the Scarlands books, which is just one campaign setting of OGL, right? They would have access to, you know, 50 different prestige classes and 200 more spells than anybody else at the table. So if I can choose my spells from a from any source, like if I'm playing a cleric or druid, for example, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the spread of options available to you is just crazy. There's literally a spell for every every circumstance you could ever come across. So, um, again, you yeah. start to understand why we see this as both... Good and bad. Exactly. The good part is so many talented people got their work discovered. The bad part is so many not quite as talented people got their work published. Well, there's let's, let's talk about, like, I want to talk about a couple of things, like, right off the bat. Scarlands was a great, great campaign setting. I'm, it's wonderful. I, I'm really glad that that came out of the D20 OGL. But there's actually a whole company, a very, very popular and powerful company that got its start in the OGL that is now making nothing, well, very few things related to role-playing and nothing related to OGL hmm. uh, many years down the line. That company is Privateer Press. Oh, yeah. Privateer Press got its launch in the OGL with a I series of adventures and a, and a brilliant monster book called the Monster Nomicon. And that's what gave them the capital to start War Machine and the rest is history. And now they are just making movies and video games. But they I have left totally forgot OGL about completely they, way behind. They started off in OGL stuff. Yeah. I, yeah. See? So there the were L so o many companies yeah. <laughs> just popping up like left and right. There were so many companies that were popping up and, and then going away. I got my start with a company called Citizen Games. And you would be very hard pressed to find any of their material anywhere these days. They made um, an NPC book called Thousand Faces, they made a book called Way of the Witch. They made uh, a few adventures, <laughs> but you know, despite making a couple of you know fairly core books and 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 a bunch of adventures, they just went under because they couldn't sustain. Exactly. Uh, they even they made uh, the first edition of uh, they made the first, as far as I'm aware, uh, Sidewinder, which is the D20 Wild West game. Mm. And yeah, oh, anyway, oh, I remember that. So so yeah, if you know Sidewinder, now Sidewinder is now with a different company, but it started with Citizen Games, and it's one of my first published. Works ever. It's, it's yeah, but there was there were so many companies that just popped up and fell flat on their faces. Yeah, but there were so many designers at this point in time where the list goes on and on. Matt Forbeck, the gatekeepers you know, were kind yeah. of pushed back in terms of: Do you have enough money to do a print run of twenty five hundred? <laughs> you can do a gay module. Yeah, and I I contributed my part to the overall like glut of prestige classes. I wrote. A series of articles for Nice at the Dinner Table that introduced like six more Paladin Prestige classes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I could, I did my part, you know, um, and and they were and, all cool, and I think they were fun, but at the same time, you know, they were indicative of that that design mentality where you want to, you know, options not restrictions. 
was the core mantra of third edition. And in a way, it was it was really, really good because it did broaden the horizons and build so many things. And um, at this point in time, I was not a designer. I was a player. I wasn't involved in the media. Right. So as a guy who was running games, I wasn't even playing. There's a reason why I met my initials, Daryl Mott, break down to DM. <laughs> I was running every fucking game in Southeast Texas, it seemed right. like. But I fucking hated every OGL company that came out because I was too big of a pussy at this point in time in my life to say no to players. Well, that was, and that was kind of the challenge. I, I ran some games and I played in a lot of games. In, in the challenge of this edition of D&D, the challenge was to limit your sources. If you could keep it to a, like, if you, if you kept it just the core, you know, books, the, the player's same book, the DMG and the Monster Manual, you could run a great game. You could run just as good a game with, like, 50 books. But if you kept it to those three, I think it was easier on you. But I'm going to tell you right now, even Wizards of the Coast in 3rd and 3.5 suffered so much bloat in terms of project. Even if you said, only official Wizards of the Coast products are allowed in my game, yeah. you were still screwed because they released so much stuff. There were companion yeah. books for every single class. One only they, I, only yeah, instead one... of the play, player's option where every class got its thing, they were split off in pairs. Yeah, I, That I, was the big one difference. Of those, one of those class books is actually my, my name appears in it. So, <laughs> yes. But um, I'm the not thing is, bitching about those books. Those no, no, books no, no, are no, really great it, you're books. Right. You're, you're right. You've got a it point. It added but, so much stuff to the system that as right. a DM trying to run a game, the players... At least my players, again, this mileage may vary, would bitch and whine until you gave in and let them play no, their I think you've broken got, S character. You've got a great point, and I, I tried to, you know, I tried to allude to this earlier. Is just that if there was so many things in the game that if you allowed everything, there was an answer to every problem, whether it was a feat, a spell, a prestige class, there was always some answer because there was so much content, and it's it saturated the content. You know, this is what I'm saying. Um, so and the that, challenge was limiting what you allowed in your game. And that kind of brings us to many, many attempts to fix many, many problems and causing so many more in the process. The transition from 3rd edition well, to 4th edition. Before, the... we, before we leave 3rd edition, I do okay. want to talk about one product. We, okay. you know, I, I have a favorite supplement for 3.5 and 3.0. Um, I mentioned Scarlands is one of my favorite. Probably my favorite setting of 3.0, 3.5 is Scarlands, I would have to say. But my favorite book is actually one of the ones that came out near the end of 3.5. It was the Book of Nine Swords, also called the Tome of Battle. And the four chanters call it the Book of Weeaboo Fightin' Magic. <laughs> and the thing about Weeaboo Fightin' Magic, or, or <laughs> Book of Nine Swords, is it really added, it added a lot of strength back into the fighter. 3.0, and I did a blog post about this, 3.0 has a thing, 3.5, 3.0, um, even Pathfinder, they have this problem where... Um, Basically, if you're a caster, a full a full caster, you're going to dominate the game in a way that, in a way that fighters, specifically fighters and many other classes uh, similar to them, like barbarians and paladins, are just not going to be able to. Inter they're not going to be able to meaningfully interact with the game on a mechanical level after a certain point, nearly as much as a full caster will. Daryl, are have, are you familiar with this? Uh, it's a problem with the system that's been going on since first edition. It's called. Linear Fighters, Quadratic Wizards. Well, I, th I think that may be true that it's been around since forever, but I think it really got exacerbated in 3.0, 3.5. Yeah. Um, well, so not really. It's well, been, it, it, it got I, I, resolved it, slightly in those editions. It was worse in first edition because you had... All right, if you I cast so. Magic Missile. Now if I'm going to so, throw darts. If you say so, that I, I'm not going to argue that. But I okay. will say that I became much more aware of it in 3.0, 3.5. It really started to more impact the game in 3.0, 3.5, and I think that's where Book of Nine Swords really came in and helped. Is it added a lot of strength to fighter type classes with these abilities and things that it introduced. It was it was actually kind of a proto of Fourth Edition in a way because it introduced like the idea of encounter powers. Yeah. Uh, the, the, these abilities that they gave to the guys in Book of Nine Swords were on a per encounter level, and I really really liked the uh, the approach that they took in that book. I thought it was probably my favorite. Uh, splat book, if you will, for 3.0 and 3.5. And that was the only thing I wanted to get to before we moved on, was that I think that was a brilliant and excellent book for 3rd edition 3.5. Well, it's a good thing you brought that up, because 4th edition is a completely different beast. 
they did one of the best and one of the worst things they could have done with D&D, with 4th edition, which is tear it down to its essentials and rebuild it from scratch. Oh, you know, there's um, there's probably one other thing we should mention. We Just, just quickly going back, like, uh, from a success point of view, like... Mm-hmm. The second edition D&D was, like, the time period where D&D was at its height. It was absolutely, like, the, you know, the most people ever played Dungeons & Dragons played it under uh, first and second D- first and second uh, AD, uh, first and second advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Yes. Third edition was extremely successful. It had, like, you know, 9 million players in 2000. They, there's a number that's been quoted as, as like, the number of, of players. And they made hundreds of thousands of books. There's numbers available, I should say, for like the financial and marketing success of the edition starting with third and 3.5. And I wanted to mention that before we get into fourth, because there is some important note, points to be made regarding that. So go ahead. Oh, yeah. But one thing they did in fourth edition was they took the system behind everything that was D&D, broke it down to its core, and tried to rebuild it again with a modern sensibility which was very, very influenced by what was going on in the current culture at the time. And again, this is 2007, 8, 9 is when they're doing the development on this. Uh, yeah, 2007 because the books came out in 2008. Yes. And I'm going to quote Jim Butcher on this. With his, He participated in the playtest for 4th edition. This is in the interview I did with him for Anical News. Which is an awesome interview, and you totally need to go see it, because it is awesome. Thank you very, very much. I was nervous as all holy hell, because Jim Butcher is one of my idols. And Check, when he check is, the show notes for a link to this interview. And when he is eventually on the podcast, you will see me reduced to a withering <laughs> quiver of fanboy. But I have to quote his review on this, even though I agree but disagree with him on this. But his review of the playtest was, New Coke. I think that is a brilliant summation, because and I happen, to, I happen to agree with that, so there you go. I agree but disagree, because <laughs> I, again, edition wars are bullshit. There is nothing objectively better than or worse than any other edition. I have run far more third and Pathfinder games than I ever have fourth edition, but... Out of the editions that are currently finalized, not counting the next playtest, 4th edition is my favorite edition of the game. And that is going to cause some people to get pissed at me on that. Now, well, hang on, hang on. There's there's controversy about 4th edition, and I, I think we have to acknowledge that WotC themselves are responsible for some of these issues. And because, they admit because, that at this point well, in time. Well, it it took them a just, long time to get around to it, but they well, are let's, admitting let's, it. Let's look at specifically the marketing for 4th edition. The marketing for 4th edition was them saying, are you still playing 3rd edition? Then you're wrong. You need yeah. to be playing... Only nerds in the basement... I'm, I'm like paraphrasing, but this is pretty close to the actual ad. Oh, I'm, only, only nerds in the basement play 3rd edition. Everyone else is on 4th edition. Yeah, they really, They really, went out really, of their really, way... To I, I hate bad to, I hate mouth to, and bash third I, edition. Yeah, I hate to I hate to really was, harp on this, but it's true that Watsi themselves went out of their way to drive a wedge. Now I want between to point people out who liked the previous edition and the new edition. So if there is a if there is a controversy, if there is an edition wars, and there is, I mean there absolutely is. Oh no! I question. think we have to I think we have to acknowledge that if some of this comes directly from the creators of the game, and I am going to make a point right now. When you're talking about Wizards of the Coast and TSR in these points in time, now this is Hasbro. These are yeah. not the same. Th- yeah, Hasbro had bought out Wizards of the Coast by this point in time, but these are not the same role-playing game companies you're used to dealing with. This is not FASA. This is not White Wolf. These are corporate structures where the people who are making the games and the people who are trying to sell the games to people are two different departments that are separated by a giant wall. It's of called corporate obstructionism. Well, you've got a point anyone that who the has worked culture, in an office. The, the corporate culture of Watsi is very different than the corporate culture of Hasbro. Yeah. So if you, if when when you, Watsi, I'm going was to, just, I'm going to play when, to the dem- Watsi, Sorry, I want to play when, to the demographic for just a second here. Okay. You work technical support. 
marketing at this point in time is sales. If you've ever held a technical job, you are laughing your ass off right now. Because that is exactly what was going on at this point in time. There were problems of communication. There were people. Basically, the marketing department was the one talking shit on 3rd edition. The people behind the game were not, may or may not have had their opinions on 3rd edition, but they were driven by the marketing. The marketing was, oh, World of Warcraft is big. We need to start emulating that so we can get our market share back. Well, let's be clear about. I want to. I want to talk briefly. Like, there is a big shift in the corporate culture. Okay, yes. Watsi. Watsi had Magic: The Gathering money, which is, which is pretty big money. You know, it's eight. It's eight nine figure money, right? That's that's a lot of money. But that is a drop in the bucket compared to what Hasbro has. So when you look at the corporate culture of three point zero and three point five, it's a completely different level of now, a game company. To put than this Hasbro. in perspective for people, Hasbro. Transformers, My Little Pony, Milton Bradley in every game they've ever made, every single board game you've probably ever played before the age of I right. found Settlers of Catan, all of these games, Cluedo or Clue, depending on what side of the ocean you're on, sorry, I've been watching too much Sherlock recently, all of these are Hasbro. Hasbro is a huge juggernaut. Right. So when it comes so this to is what I'm getting at. family entertainment. In in 3.0, if every single D&D &D player in the world bought a copy of Dungeons and Dragons on the same day, Watsi would have gone, "Wow, that's amazing." They would have noticed that it would have been a big deal. If every single D&D &D player in the world bought a copy of 4th edition, Hasbro would not even notice. Exactly, because there would there would not even be a memo. Again, you know what I mean? Transformers. <laughs> Transformers, GI yeah. Joe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is so. this is what we're, we want the listeners to be aware of that fourth edition DD was created in a totally different environment than third edition was, and it's just it's important to be to be now, aware of that. I, I want to point out a timeline thing here. Hasbro had acquired Wizards of the Coast by the time third edition actually started to make its role. I think it was two thousand one, two thousand two, that Hasbro actually acquired Wizards of the Coast. So. But the ball was already rolling but at that point in time, and Hasbro knew that when they went into the deal. So I just wanted to make that clear. Well, you know, it, one other thing we actually forgot to mention about um, 3rd Edition is that it was so well-researched. Like, it was the biggest playtest ever, basically. They had the most... Second. Uh, they, they, they put out a, an enormous uh, effort to get feedback from players. 4th Edition did have a huge playtest as well. But there's been a big backlash over that playtest because a lot of people involved in it that I've talked to have stated that any feedback was ignored in favor of marketing. Well, anyway, I, I just wanted to be clear that there was, you know, we, we when we were talking about third edition, it was a, a in, in my opinion, it was the biggest, most largest ever playtest uh, or basically f player. Uh, Actual feedback from actual groups was, was taken into account with that. Fourth edition, as you said, is based on a different style of game. And particularly, it's based on MMO gameplay. What you can tell, the moment you pick up the first player's handbook for that, when it came out in 2008, where they started talking about roles, which was... Defender, striker, Defender, a.k.a. tank... Striker, controller, yeah. What's the what's the other one? Striker, controller, defender. Striker, defender, controller, healer. Leader. 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 That's right. Yeah. Well, healer so, in MMOs. But. Well, yeah, and basically that the, the, it was it was definitely. Ba I mean, I have, again, I've spoken to people very close to this, and and MMOs were absolutely something they were basing this game on. That's not an idle. That's that's not an idle person just saying, oh, they based on MMO. That's like people actually involved. We're like, yeah, we totally based on MMOs. Um, and anyone who's looked at the game can tell yeah, that. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's in but my it's, opinion, it's fairly obvious, but I, I, I'm aware that there's a lot of people out there who don't believe that's true, and I'm just saying and my sources say it is. But for the record, I'm a huge 4th edition defender. I love 4th edition for what it is. They're called Four Avengers, I believe. <laughs> a, I, I hate don't know. that I don't word, know. because I don't that, know. Just, that just sounds like a bad portmanteau, and I don't like uh, it. Yeah, well, anyway... 
Um, but I, like I said, so, fourth edition is my favorite of the fully published adventures. And I want to make this clear. As systems, much as I'm talking. Systems. Fully published systems. Yeah, thank you. I, as much as I keep talking bad about fourth edition, I really do love it. It is my favorite combination because I feel it's also one of the most misunderstood editions of D and D. Well, there's a there's a lot of good reasons why it's misunderstood. Again, maybe possibly a marketing decision, but they came out with what was called the uh, Essentials line, which really all that did. I mean, it was an attempt to like um, it well, was an attempt was to simplify. A break that came out later on. Well, where sure, it but. Was... But it, but it, it's it it further muddied the waters about what fourth edition really was, and this is why I'm saying it's very misunderstood. Is like they try to make everything core, every book yes. is a core book, and then they said, well, there's the essentials line, and it's called the essentials line, but it's actually not core books, and it's like a completely, it's almost a completely now, different game. So it, there's there is confusion not just from the perspective of someone who wants to play the game. There's confusion from the people who are making the games themselves. Oh, and then this is also the era where there D and D really started to get a resurgence about this point in time because of cross media things. Big Bang Theory had a D and D episode around this time. Community, a community had their had the big best D and D episode. Had the best D and D episode. <laughs> Best or second best, depending on whether you're a community or a Geeks and Freaks fan. Well, another thing the 4th edition did really, really well is they did this thing called the Encounter System. And it set up a very casual um, get-together at a game store and just play. And it was uh, a complete drop-in system. It was, you it was an, could yeah. show up any day of the week. It didn't matter if they were mid-campaign. You could just, and just jump play. in. Yeah, And that's probably, in my opinion, one of the best things about 4th edition is that it's just extremely accessible. It's extremely quick to get started. It's extremely quick to play. It's probably the easiest edition of Dungeons & Dragons to get people into and playing right away. I would say that's probably its biggest strength. But having said that, I have to say, well, with I, all respect to Daryl, with all I, respect to Daryl, well, I... Before you, before you get to your... I, I kind of want to disagree <laughs> with you on the... It is the right. easiest to get people up and running in that it also has, in terms of... Overall role play, it has the steepest learning curve, in my opinion, of any edition of D and D. Well, that that may be true. When but it I'm comes, to, if I but just it is s- also the most flattened in that you can play a fighter or a wizard or whatever, and you have the same learning curve well, across this the board. Is, this is what I'm saying: is like if I just want to get five people over and play a game, if I'm using fourth edition, I can probably get that ready in the fastest amount of time. And there's a reason why in the fourth edition era the blogging community for role-playing games really blew up which a lot of my friends online uh past and future guests are bloggers who basically kind of took the system as it was and explained how to run it effectively which shouldn't have required that really well, and, and I just wanted to say that you, you've already come out and said that this is your favorite edition. Yes. And I'm, I'm going to say that on the record, and with all due respect to Daryl, uh, this is actually my least favorite edition of Dungeons & Dragons. I won't say it's Yeah, we're bad. not breaking up the band over this. We no, disagree, but it, respectively, I, I'm, I I'm, respect I'm, Ross's opinion yes. on this. <laughs> I, I fall most heavily on the Jim Butcher side of things, where I look at it and say it's a good game. Um, it's got some, some good elements and design to it, but it doesn't really work for me as a D and D game, or or as a a role playing game, because that I want to play now. So and again, so every that. it has its strengths, like every it other. Does. Edition. It definitely and its does. Biggest strength, hands down, and I have never heard anyone who could argue with me over its biggest strength is balance. Well, game you know, balance amongst <laughs> characters. Well, here's the thing: is like from a game designer's perspective, and I wrote a blog post about this too. But I think that games that are balanced are actually not as much fun as games that are imbalanced. I think what happened with 4th edition is that they kind of sacrificed a lot of creativity and fun on the altar of, of balance. You're right, it's a very balanced game. I mean, if, if that's what you want me to agree with, I will absolutely agree. It is a very, very balanced game. Yes. But I think that they, they did that at the expense of fun, which is kind of my problem with it. Now, um, where I will disagree with you on that is... I don't think they sacrificed it on the altar of balance, per se, as much as they did on the altar of combat. 
because fourth edition is it's all heavily, about yeah it's if the, you ever pick up an adventure for fourth edition and you look at each page is basically like here's it a is a counter. two page here's spread on how to this is from this is literally from the designers of the game look up my interview with bruce cordell when he was working yeah. for wizards of the coast and robert swab on any cool news they admitted to this the design paradigm was two page spreads over here's a map here's what's on the map and here's the encounter setting right which again i think adds to the strength of the game in that it's speed of play you know it's very it's very very quick to get a game going with that and you know it in, took in a lot way, of weight and like i said D- yeah daryl mott dm initials i'm always yeah. running the game fourth edition is a dm's game because it is so easy to organize and stress as a game because they have everything so balanced. Yeah. Everything is so balanced. It is so easy to just at the last minute throw shit together and come up with a cool adventure. Right. It, and that is true. And and like I said, you know, I love there's there's things that fourth edition I think did really, really well. The skill system not the skill challenges specifically, but the skills. Oh, don't get me the, started on the skill yeah, challenges. Let's not talk about the skill challenges, <laughs> but but the actual like the idea of skill challenges is really cool, and the the uh, execution was. Let's botched. let's just leave that at that. Um, but the but the the way they did the skills is like a small list of very broad skills. I I actually really like that approach. Yeah, it was. I thought that was a good way to go. And that's one of the things I get into arguments online a lot about is the skill system for fourth edition. It was it basically distilled everything down to its essence, in terms of the hell do you need separate acrobatics and athletic skills for when you can combine them in one skill yeah. and split the attribute they're tied to. Well, there's, I mean, so we can go on it, it makes a lot about of, the system. For, a lot for, of things, but there are also a lot of bad things about it. One thing I want to talk about real quick in 4th edition is that it's something I've actually written in the notes this way. Character optimization or die. Because there was a big push in this edition, and it was very inspired by MMOs, I think, where you cannot build outside of the optimal build. They had powers they kept trying to shove in that would give you role-playing advantages like skill checks to diplomacy diplomacy, and blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Can you kill a monster? And that really hurt the system because if you take one of those role-playing options, you're kind of screwing your party in a way. Well, that's, I mean, that's kind of where I had some issues with the game is that because of the way the powers work, it was very difficult to be creative with that, without feeling like you were screwing everyone at the table. Because, like, the you kind of had you, to fill the mold. The cards that you had in your hand, and the power cards are really cool, by the way. I love the power cards. But it, but the, but it, it kind of limited you. It made you kind of play within the box of what the car, what was on the cards and which cards you had in your hand. And I, I'm always that kind of guy that I want to do something where I'm like, I want to be creative. I want to come up with like, I'm going to jump off the chandelier. I know, want to be and, the halfling, halfling swashbuckler. Barbarian. You know, I'm gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing behind the guy and, you know, cut off his, his belt buckle. Halfling his Barbarians, you can't do that in 4th edition because well, you're y- completely breaking the care op, which well, would screw <laughs> up everyone else if they're playing care op. And if yeah, you have, it just, if you have a lot even of things... one player at your, ter- at your table that's playing character optimization and they are sitting there reading the forms and everything else, it can fuck up game balance so badly. Yeah, I, I, and that's that's like I said, one of my issues with it is that there you just if you if you play outside what what your mold is, you're 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 actually not only hurting yourself, you're hurting everyone else, and and that's what I didn't I didn't care for. Um, but lastly, I think that one of my biggest issues was was the fact of verisimilitude, and what I mean by that is uh, the, the the DM's guide for fourth edition basically says that Dungeons and Dragons is supposed to be a number of encounters separated by brief periods of travel. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but um, yes. And I was like, I was like, really? That's that's what you imagine you need to be is a fight, and then I travel, and I fight, and then I travel. And I was like, uh, you know, I don't get that. And then you look at like a lot of the abilities that they have, the the, the powers and stuff that they put in the book, like the warlord, right? And he heals mm-hmm. people by yelling at them. And hey, like, come okay. on, you can do it. And get I'm like, better. I'm I'm okay with. And all of a sudden, I'm okay with that in, in, as an idea. But the problem is that the book doesn't tell you why that works in the world. There's no verisimilitude to that ability 
functioning in the world. And and the part that, that bugs me the most is that the, the designers of the game didn't feel like that was important for me to know why it worked that way. Well, so you have, here's the you, thing. You is, feel like they these abilities kind of A lot in of that stuff they hid. And it's a shame that it turned out this way because I really think 4th edition wouldn't have been as maligned as it is if they had been able to put forward a lot of these ideas they had. It was obvious what the idea behind, for example, the Warlord was. You could tell what they were trying to do. Because of how it was presented, it didn't come across as well if you didn't read every single scrap of every single flavor text on the thing. Uh, one thing I always talk about is, again, DM perspective. I really like the way they did monsters, where you could just drop them in and drop them out based on things. But one thing that I missed from 3rd edition was the flavor that a lot of the monsters had. And you have to dig in to get some of them. And the core example I point out in my interview with, I believe, Ari Marmel on Any Cool News. I keep, I hate keep, I hate to keep pipping my own article, but <laughs> no, it's a great article. There's but that. he brought up a very interesting point. In fourth edition, you had to be very creative when you design monsters from a design perspective. You had to pay attention when you're running it from a DM's perspective, where I would sit there and base encounters based on, okay, this undead creature has, and it, I'm running an undead encounter. This undead creature does more damage to people who are immobilized. This person grapples, which immobilizes, which is part of that subset of that condition. So I'm going to do these guys, and I put them together, and then I'm running the encounter, and I'm in the middle of combat. When my jaw drops and I realize that the monsters that do the immobilizing are doing so by, they're an undead creature, they rip the guts out of their own intestine and lasso their See, opponents that's cool. <laughs> to grapple them. <laughs> that's and cool. I'm like, like that. that is fucking, okay. And I'm sitting there, I'm reading that description and it's a way of slipping stuff past the sensors in a way, I guess. But when I'm reading that, I'm like, my eyes go up and I'm like, okay, hang on, back up. We need to go back a turn and let me re-describe what just happened. And because it had to get buried, some of that stuff got lost. Well, you know, there's it's it's also interesting, like, the creators of the 4th edition. And, and see, Watsi was kind of doing this weird thing where they were firing people, like, every Christmas. <laughs> and they had well, a big it design wasn't team. Well, it wasn't every Christmas. It was every end of fiscal quarter. Trust Which me. came really close to that. And it was. The, it trust me. Working in accounting, the I, I, end of the I fiscal you, year the, is December. The perception, the perception is that it was a Christmas layoff, yeah. and it was it eventually became called the Christmas layoff. So you had the <laughs> you originally had this big team, and it kind of got whittled down over time. But um, there's actually a recent blog post, um, November nineteenth. Uh, Robert Schwab put up a blog post about um, you know his, his experiences working. Yeah, and send me uh. Send I'll make a, sure that you, that that is in the the show notes. Yeah, send me a and link he, to that because I'm a, interested because he's a friend of mine. So. Yeah, and and he has a really interesting point about some of the things he was working on um, that I think applies to fourth edition, saying that role playing games became like an exercise of pure math, um, systems of moving parts uh, that would produce a predictable play experience, and that improvisation, storytelling, and role playing were unquantifiable aspects that he just didn't feel needed the attention of the game designer. And I think he has changed his opinion on that. I think I believe that's what that blog post is saying now is like he's sort of coming away from that pure math to the you know mm -hmm. maybe maybe I need to pay attention why maybe it's important for the reader to know why the guy shouts at him and he heals. And I think I think that's just uh, I I believe I that there's a, been from what there, I think from what I've talked I, to from Wizards of the Coast employees. That seems to be across the board that they've kind of realized that. Yeah, well, it, it didn't... I mean, I want to talk... Like, 4th edition, we, I, I have been bashing it a lot, and I, I apologize for that, but I think it's 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 also borne out that this, in terms of the market, that the, the market spoke very, very clearly about 4th edition. I think the guys at Watts, or at least the game design guys, heard that. Um, because when 4th edition came out, and they had this, this big issue, 
um, with, you know, saying, w- with the marketing things that we talked about earlier and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and another part of the reason why Edition Wars and 4th Edition will almost always be connected is at the same time you had the launch of Pathfinder. Which was directly related to the open gaming license that we talked about before. Yes. And there's some debate. I don't know if there's that much debate, but at least there is on my part, because I'm a 4th edition fanboy. But early on, there was a lot of debate in terms of exactly what Paizo did to 4th edition, or excuse me, to 3.5 to justify the entire switch. Is well, it, they had. To, I think. I think it was a, a, a factor of the licensing agreement. I think they couldn't just slap a new title on. I think they had to make a certain number of changes. At least, uh, you know, I'm, I'm. I'm guessing. Honestly, I don't know. I'm guessing. But and Pathfinder did make a lot of changes in terms of mechanics. Well, let's be but clear. Not in terms of feel when it comes let's be, to let's, three point five. Let's be, let's be absolutely clear. Pathfinder is basically three point five D and D with a few rules changes. I mean, it's it's With like an it's like major a errata. Well, yeah, it, but but at the, at its heart, it is the same rule set. I think I I, I believe that is incontrovertible that it's the same basic rule set at three point five. Now they did fix some things. Uh, Pathfinder is an upgrade, and you're right that they did add like you know a lot of errata. Um, barbarians got better, bards got better, um, druids got worse, clerics stayed <laughs> the same and still dominate the druids. Game. Druids still too. Actually, um, but yeah, um, druids and, druids and not, clerics are still kind of the kings. Druids but. don't quite dominate as much as they not as did, bad. Yes, but... not as bad, but they're still but they're still rocking it. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> the point is, is that they did improve the game and they did change a few things. I, I it, it is. I have I, to I, say, I hate, the best I hate to say, cosmetic. It is you know, like again, you know, from a designer, I see the the core of it being identical. Um, so to me, when I say cosmetic, you know that probably may piss some people off. I, I apologize for that. And I as like a play- and as a player, I've got to say, my favorite. Oh, God damn it! <laughs> I bumped right the there? mic. I- I'm talking with my hands, and I bumped the mic. <laughs> as a player, I've got to say, my favorite hands down change that Pathfinder made was. Wizards don't throw darts or shoot crossbows anymore because they have something Bells. there. They got a magic thing they can do. Yes, and that's cool. And they added, you know, they, what, what was interesting to me about how finders, they followed, like, the, I asked... Uh, and cats will no longer kill my fucking wizard! I, I spoke directly to uh, Lisa Stevens about this one time, and I asked her, and she said that, um, something really interesting, she said that they were following a... Uh, production schedule very similar to how 3.0 was supposed to go, which is they have a lot of adventures and maybe one core book a year, one or two, and they keep the number of prestige classes down to a, a very, very small amount. And they're basically really encouraging people to play single class characters. They're they're building a lot of their material around that you will be a fighter your whole career. You will be a wizard your whole career. And I'll and they, get into that in a moment. But but I think that's a really smart way to go because it is avoiding a lot of the issues that plagued 3.5 or we talk, talked about it already before. Okay, the, that uh, moment is apparently now. Um, with the glut of, of prestige classes and, and, and problem feats. with prestige classes in Pathfinder is that they are so... They were... It appears a reaction to the prestige classes in 3rd edition and 3.5, where they were so overpowered that the prestige classes in Pathfinder are underpowered. Yeah, and I'm okay with that. I Again, I think it goes back to their paradigm that they want you to just play the same class. You shouldn't be a wizard and then, uh, and then like, a, a, you know, a sacred spellcaster or whatever, you know, prestige class says. You're going to be a wizard your whole career, and there's nothing wrong with that. And um, a lot of their, their design decisions based around kind of offering slightly different options for your race and your class, I, I kind of dig it. I, I see that they're, you know, taking an approach to that uh, options, not restrictions, that is less of the, the issue where the game master has to worry about, you know, what he allows at the table and is more willing to embrace, you know, having different things uh, for different players to play. Now, I have stated I'm a 4th edition guy. 
I like 4th edition better than Pathfinder. That's my edition wars. End of it. <laughs> we already agreed that every edition but, has its strengths and weaknesses. But I recognize the strengths and weaknesses of Pathfinder. And when I talked about earlier on, when I talked about converting not to next, but I converted uh, the against the Giants and the first Underdark D1 module okay. for D&D. I converted those to Pathfinder. I felt the Pathfinder system fit the story I was trying to tell better. It wasn't as combat focused. It was a little bit more exploration focused, but it was still combat focused. And that's what my players gravitated to. And that's what caused a lot of my problems with Pathfinder. (laughs) Well, to be fair, those problems have been around since the beginning of, as you say, since the beginning. And as I've pointed out, like, I really noticed them in 3.0, 3.5. So, you know, the fact that they're still around in Pathfinder, I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, that's just kind of an artifact of that class level design. The biggest ones that, and this is 4th edition's greatest success is that it managed to fix these problems. And its greatest failure is that it managed to cause more problems and fixing them are the two quintessential problems with D&D-based role-playing. Linear Warriors, Quadratic Wizards, yep, and the 15-minute workday. Yeah. Yeah, that's still a factor. And Pathfinder, Pathfinder Both those things are didn't still factors. fix those, but 4th edition tried, but it caused so many more problems in its wake in terms of trying to balance encounter powers and blah, blah, blah. And, yeah. Now, when Pathfinder first launched, it was basically 3.5 with a crap load of errata because... Anyone who tried to deal with the grappling rules <laughs> That's in infamous. third of three point five, yeah, will pray at the altar of Paizo for introducing the CMB and CMD. Yeah. Oh my God, that solves so many problems. Well, I think it's also important to point out. We talked about you know people kind of hearing the market speak. It's pretty obvious right now that in the marketplace, that Pathfinder has succeeded wildly. It's currently outselling all other role-playing games across the world. It is the most popular role-playing game in the world. Here's the problem with uh, the trying to judge... I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, 4th edition is coming less. The best source we have for strong data in terms of sales when it comes to which edition is doing better than the other comes from ICV2, which is a... It was started for comic book publishers and goes to independent comic book stores and surveys them on what's selling and what's not. And it's a really, really good indication of what's going on in the core gaming community, but it ignores factors like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, even going back a little bit, Borders. Yeah, but if you look at even the Amazon sales, it's obvious that Pathfinder is outselling. But it's also... Uh, yeah. When was the last time Wizards of the Coast came out? With Listen, I, I, there's a lot of factors thought. involved. There's a lot of factors involved. You're right that Watsi has stopped publishing 4th edition and, and had for years. I mean, they, they basically took themselves out of the game. Um, but I don't think you can... Ar- I don't think it is fair to argue... Ag- I, I don't see how anyone could say that it's At not this point the most time, popular role-playing game. Pathfinder is the most is the best-selling role-playing game on the market right now. Yes, that's what I'm With an asterisk. <laughs> okay, all right. But... No, no, you know, it, I, I just want to point out that I think that, that there is some... There is definitely some strong evidence, maybe not, maybe not conclusive evidence, but there's some strong evidence that Pathfinder has surged to the top. And no question across the board. Pathfinder has really, really, really become, if not top dog in the role-playing game industry, if no one would argue that there are at least one of the top two tiered role-playing game companies when it comes to Paizo. Nobody can question that. In terms of sales figures, in terms of anything. Now, here's the question. With D&D Next coming out soon, what can Paizo do to hold on to that slice of the pie? 
That's a really good question, because I think Pathfinder has kind of played out, at least this edition. I think they've published just about everything they can. It's it's going to be... It's going to be interesting to see where they go from here. I, I almost suspect that they might just do a new edition of, of Pathfinder. They are not. Well, I have talked okay. to people involved. <laughs> they are not doing a new edition. They do not see any reason to do a new edition. You know, and they're probably right. I, I, I can't imagine. Really, I think it's it's not Paizo's game to win. I think it's Watsi's game to lose. I think that's what we're talking about. I really cannot disagree with that. As big of a Watsi fanboy as I am, I cannot disagree with that because now we completely skipped over something when it comes to when it comes to role playing games in the modern market, and that's the old school renaissance. Yeah, and I don't want it to to diminish that whatsoever, but I think we kind of covered everything involved in the OSR, and when we covered each individual edition, and OSR, every single game for OSR seems to want to ape on what one edition or another was trying to accomplish. Well, it's, I, I think it's fair to say that, that so. it doesn't doesn't exactly fit the criteria of our discussion because we were just talking about D&D specifically. Now, OSR is a great movement that's sort of related to D&D, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in the same category as core D&D stuff. Okay, fair enough. I mean, but no, no slight against them, and I think most of you guys would agree I, that what really they've done is to, not D&D. Yeah, okay. I really wanted to make sure we talked about them at least a little bit, but... Well, I think we absolutely we, acknowledged we've talked about them. Every because, single edition we've talked about, Yeah, everything that we've said applies to OSR in terms of, except for a very, very few, like Basic Fantasy and 13th Age, are the well, only ones who are really trying to completely break down the mechanics and try something new, but to be honest... If I said anything about either of those two systems, I would be speaking from complete ignorance because yeah, I've, I haven't looked at either age, one. But I don't, I haven't played it yet, and uh, it looks like it would be some really cool, you know, improvements and and ramp and refinements of uh, of a third edition game to me. So there's that. But and I could speak say the same thing about Basic Fantasy. I'm more experienced with Basic Fantasy than I am with Thirteenth Age, and it's. A really, really cool system. It, I can see what they're doing. They're trying to take those first edition mechanics and translate them to a modern audience, but I haven't played it. I haven't tried to run the system yet. I've just kind of read everything they've done, and that's kind of an unfair way to try to judge the system. Well, I want to say something here about where where Watsi should go, because yes. we, we did bring that up. And honestly, I feel like that the the whole controversy between fourth edition and Pathfinder, I think that's kind of poisoned the well. I think that the the fracture between that fan base is is too deep to heal with just a game. I mean, in in my opinion, the only way that Watsi can surge back to the top is to make something to make a game unlike anything we've ever seen before. I think the bar right now is just too high for them I to possibly hit. Completely and, so, and utterly disagree with you on that. Well, I'm, I'm, let me finish my thought here, though. I, I think that D and D as a brand, though, is rescuable, but I don't think it can. I don't think it can be rescued and, and returned to its superior prominence on just one game. I would instead say my suggestion would be that they should take D and D as a brand and do things with it, like, you, you know, take it and do what Hasbro does really well and make like some great cartoons out of it. Make like um, you know how Young Justice was was great for, was for adults say, how, and how Teen Titans was great for kids. Why can't we do, you know, a Forgotten Realms cartoon How? for adults? What, what eight-year-old would not love a Dritzt cartoon? For Seriously. God's sake? Yeah, I think I think that Hasbro could take their brand knowledge. Cross and marketing. The, they could they could make they could take D and D to the new My Little Pony if they really wanted to. Now here's the thing: they're kind of working on that with their. And forgive me, audience, if I mispronounce this. It's called Creo, K R E dash O, but it's basically. Hasbro's ripoff on Legos. Well, I can't call it anything else because, for God's sake, it's Hasbro's ripoff on Legos. But they've <laughs> started releasing D and D themed Crayo. I I hear what you're saying, but I I I have to say I don't think they're going far enough. I mean, this is this is what I'm saying to you is I think that if Hasbro really wanted to reinvigorate the brand, and they could, they would be basically. It feels like they're passing up a huge pile of money by not doing it. See what I'm saying? Well, it's there's also a lot of 
if you want to talk about in terms of visual media, TV, film, cartoons, blah, 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 that's where Sweet Pea Entertainment gets involved, and that's where IP Law gets involved, and I've covered that a lot on Any Cool News, and dear God, is it a bitch to try to figure that shit out. Well, all right. Oh, uh, my God. I, I think is... let's, let's go back to the point that you wanted to to disagree with, because I, I am curious. I want to hear your, your, your point about my this. My Because I said that, because what I said was I don't think a game is going to rescue it. Unless and that game hits a bar that's so I high, I can't think, even imagine it. I think a game can rescue D and D because D and D has brand recognition that Paizo's wet dreams could not even achieve in that their is, wet dreams. That is a true fact. That is a true because fact. Because every single time I run a Pathfinder game, phone call comes in from the wife. Guy picks up the phone. Sorry, I'm busy playing D and D right now. I'll even when I'm playing Pathfinder, people are still calling it D&D. They have a brand recognition that is just dying to be exploited. I agree with that, but I don't... This is what I'm saying. And I the cross-media the thing core, and blah, blah, they can... But they need, they, need new, they need new people to get in on that brand. I think now, the existing fan base... This is what I'm saying. The existing fan base is too splintered. I now, think. the existing fan base isn't the problem. Because it doesn't matter. WotC could put out the greatest, best, most awesome system. It is the perfectly mechanically balanced with story and everything else system ever. Put it out and the fanboys of whatever system that they prefer would sit there and say, this sucks because WotC put it out. Well, there's always going to be grognards. But what I, my point is, is that I think... There was a time where they could have. There was a time where D and D was the standard, and, and I don't. They could make it again. Well, the they they issue. could, but I don't think it, I don't think it's going to do that entirely on just a game. It's going to have to be more than just a game. And I agree and disagree with what you just said. Okay. Not just a game. No, they have to. Hasbro really needs to monetize on this brand name of D D. All the novels, all the character recognition, all the fan base has been built up over the past forty fucking years. They really need to pay attention to these people. Like us. And build something on that. But in order for the game to survive, they really need to draw in the new fans. Now, here's a question well, to well, now you. This is well. This is what I'm saying is that right now is the time to do that. Because exactly. Because fantasy has never been bigger. You got Hobbit. You got Game of Thrones. It's just pounding if through you, the if popular you want to go back culture. A bit, Lord of the Rings and blah blah blah. Yeah, it is. Fantasy as a genre is blowing up right now. Now here is my question to you. Let's just say you've watched the Lord of the Rings movies. You went to the theater and watched the Hobbit, the first Hobbit movie. Maybe you saw right. the second one yet. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet either. I will have seen it by the time you've listened to this, but... Because... <laughs> now, let me ask you, as someone who has just come into d d say you just watched Lord of the Rings. Right. You just watched the first d d episode of Community, or the one that's going to come in this next upcoming season, d d episode of Community, or you're a Community fan, you listen to Harmontown... Okay, okay, so now what? Now, you are kind of curious about this D&D thing. What are you going to do? Are you going to go buy this $50 Pathfinder book and try to figure out everything that's going on in this Pathfinder book that's 400, 500 pages long? I'll or, buy the Pathfinder starter box is what I'll do. That's not in print <laughs> until okay. March. Okay, all right, all right. But... You're wanting to get into D&D. Pathfinder. What's Pathfinder? I don't know Pathfinder. I know D&D. That's where they need to focus their marketplace on. I agree. I agree that's where they, they need to go. They really need to focus on this. Yeah. But here's God, the thing. it's such a bad term in this. This hipster market of neo-nerds. <laughs> These well, people that are really coming into the hobby for the first time, they need an introduction well, we haven't talked about Next very much, and I think there's a reason for that. I I honestly have been keeping myself completely away from it. I, I don't 
I haven't looked at any of the play tests. I haven't seen anything. And, and I've been and following wanna, it like a hog. So. Well, I, I don't want to – here's the thing is I don't want to get too heavy into it because it, it could change between now and then. I mean, between – when we talk about it now, when the final product, who knows, right? Uh, so – Let's. Why don't you? Why don't you talk about next a little bit, just so people know what it. You know. Oh. What yeah. what is Please known? Please let for me sure rant about, about next. <laughs> I, if I hadn't put that self-imposed next doesn't count as a new edition of D and D because it hasn't finished yet. Next would be my favorite edition of D and D because it brings all the things I love about D and D, puts them together, and it's been slicing off the things i'm not a fan of and keeping what's core to it and i really think they've learned their lessons from the divide that came from fourth edition here's the way i describe it it is first edition D D with that wonder and magnificence and ev- exploration and everything else with a 21st century design mechanic mentality in that you can actually read the rules and understand what the hell is going on and play the game. I have been pimping the playtest documents for forever. At this point in time, if you have not signed up for the playtest for next, whether you're a diehard Pathfinder fan, 2nd edition, 1st edition, whatever, at the very least, go sign up for the playtest. This is probably your last chance while it's still open. Go get the playtest packet read through it, and then tell them what you think. And even if your opinion is, fuck Wizards of the Coast, do Pathfinder, I don't care, because every single bit of feedback is going to lead into a better game, which is my biggest thrill when it comes to Next, is they are actually listening to our feedback. And I can point to you objective evidence of this fact. Because in the December playtest packet, they put out two new classes. The Warlock and the Sorcerer. That sounds like an awesome 80s movie. Yeah. (laughs) It would be awesome to watch that. But the only problem was, looking at these classes compared to the other classes, they were so fucking broken. The Sorcerer was so underpowered... No one would play a sorcerer, and the warlock was so overpowered uh, that it that. broke the da- damn game. In the next playtest. Oh, well, okay. I'm not you're, talking you're, about you're any talking about, other edition. Okay. All right, my bad. Okay. In the next playtest, in terms of comparing that to, say, the wizard, rogue, cleric, core set, paladin. Okay. They got feedback from their playtest survey they sent out in January that when they released a new playtest packet in February of 2013, those classes were gone. And they have not been back yet because they went back to the drawing board. So Wizard of the Coast is listening to our feedback right now. And that is a massive improvement over what happened in 4th edition, where... Again, I can't speak for internal politics from Wizards of the Coast, but from what I've heard from playtesters is they would submit feedback and Wizards of the Coast would say, no, we've got our marketing people telling us we need to do this. That's not what happened now. You've, you've given me some hope. You know, you're very passionate about it. It's very clear about that. And you give me some hope by what you say there. And, and, and I believe that. To be devil's advocate, though, I do want to point out that there has been an exodus of some really talented game designers during the development of of, of Next. Monty Cook and being the first and foremost Monty, of Monty those. Cook being probably the most prominent. I'm not going there. I'm just saying that there's a lot of really talented guys who started working on 5th who are no longer work or Next, who are no longer working on Next. And it's a little worrying to me to, to look at those really talented guys and say... Well, if they're not working on it anymore, I'm not sure who is who is still, you know, I think a good designer. They're trying to do something different, and I've been following this since the very first playtest packet of Next, and I really, really think they are taking in to account feedback from the players. That's why they did an open playtest in this. They weren't giving lip service 
they weren't trying to oh pathfinder did an open play test we should do it too and then ignore everything they say and do what we want that's not what they're doing here they are really focused on getting the best core elements of D D for us and the biggest thing i can speak in favor of watsi and what they're doing right now is that they're trying to mend bridges that have been burnt for decades when it comes to the campaign settings that we talked about before they are they have gotten in contact with keith baker he has gone on the record with that I have talked with Margaret Weiss. Margaret Weiss has said that she hasn't been in contact with Wizards of the Coast, but she'll be willing to talk to them again about bringing back Dragonlance as a setting and being involved in that. Um, I haven't heard from Tracy Hickman yet because I don't have any ends with him. So what you're saying is there's hope. You feel they like there's a lot of Ed hope Greenwood on the horizon. Back on. Ed Greenwood's been writing a monthly column for him until they shut down oh, Dragon. Okay. So I'm just saying they're you're, bringing you're, these what, what old school I'm back. Trying they're to trying summarize to here. mend these bridges between the yes. old school fans. So let's just say, let's wrap it up with saying you're you're very you are very uh, uh, optimistic about the future with next. I am. You think next is the thing, and I haven't looked at it, so I'm going to take your word for it that it is the next thing. I'm just I'm a little worried that the the challenge ahead of them is going to be too high for even a really really good game to hurdle. But I hope that I hope it's every bit as good as you say. My so only problem I I foresee with it is that tabletop gaming has been on the rise, fiscally speaking, for the past six years. It has been a growth industry. The thing is, I really think the mindset that Wizards of the Coast has at this point in time is still based back in the TSR days, when it comes to their corporate organization and everything else. I really think they need to address that before they start really they should really figure this out they need to get the engine humming before they start working on the cup holders yeah okay that's pretty good and my issue is the industry has changed so much since a lot of these people that are top dogs in charge have been in charge that they really need to take a look at the outside industry and pay attention to the indie groundswell, really low budget, really streamlined thing that a lot of RPG... What's the top RPG company in the industry? You're either going to say Wizards of the Coast or Paizo. What's second? You're going to say Wizards of the Coast or Paizo. What's third? Probably Fantasy Flight or Green Ronin. Um... Although that's going to be the reaction to a lot yeah, of most, people. Most people, you're right. Most people are going to say, um, that's true. You're right. Fantasy Flight's RPG, I love what they did with Star Wars, but their RPG sector is not their main income no, stream. No, you're right. And, 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 it and is what, their your board point, game Your market. point is, is that there's a huge tier difference exactly. between the top two and everybody else. And that and is a very I don't point. think WotC has realized that yet, and I'm really worried Paizo hasn't figured that out yet either. Well, and both of these companies need to realize that and really focus on their core market or they're going to overextend themselves and burn out and then we're going to have no one at the top, really. Well, I think we've had an excellent discussion about Dungeons & Dragons and I think you and I both agree Dungeons & Dragons is one of our favorite games of all time. It's okay, absolutely yes. the father of tabletop role-playing. And it is second to Shadowrun to me. Well, which, okay, but if you've heard me yeah. talk about Shadowrun, it's still that's one of our favorite. Lot. One of our favorite games is Dungeons yes. and Dragons, and all of these editions, as we said, all of these editions have their strengths and weaknesses. All of them are good games, and I'm, what I think is awesome is that we had this really, really. This is the longest episode we've ever had. We've had this discussion about Dungeons and Dragons and all the different editions, permutations, and we're still friends. Oh god, yes. <laughs> you know, and I, had, I was kind of—I I was actually worried about the cold open. I was going to say, and this was the episode that <laughs> broke up. No, the gamers I think, tavern. I think everyone in the tavern is actually shocked that we had, we didn't come to blows over it. We uh, we had a we agreed discussion. to disagree over everything we disagreed with because yeah, and, I can see know, your point of view on everything you've said. It's like 
yeah, I see that. I may not agree with it, but I see what you're saying. Yeah, and I can, and I will, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that you're wrong for believing that. I'm just going to say, okay, you know, we're we're looking at it differently. And so, that, ladies and gentlemen, is why edition wars are bullshit. <laughs> well, I think the thing I want to leave the show on um is just that Dungeons Dragons ha- will no matter what happens, Dungeons Dragons will be always be a big part of my life. And uh I I believe that's also true for Daryl. I I believe it will be a part of all of our lives. So I I hope that all of your hits will be crits. Thank you for joining us on episode 11 of the Gamer's Tavern, and we'll see you guys on the next episode of Gamer's Tavern coming soon. Check the show notes for all the links, and you guys have a good one. Take care. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Gamer's Tavern, and honestly, I am still wiped from Space City Con this past weekend. I had an absolute blast. It was a ton of fun. Got to play a lot of cool games. And I will probably be talking about that in the episode. And you'll be hearing it in two weeks. We're recording it tomorrow. When we talk about our what we played in gaming. But uh, I don't really have anything on my schedule as far as conventions go for the foreseeable future. Um, I'm still trying to solidify my schedule when con season starts ramping up. But Ross is going to be at Chupacabra Con in Austin, Texas from January 17th through the 19th. And he's also going to be at Genghis Con in Aurora, Colorado from February 13th through 16th. I'm sure he would be thrilled to talk to any of our listeners. And if you get the chance, even though most of them are filled up, I would really recommend trying to jump into any of his games. The guy is a genius when it comes to gaming. There's a reason why he hosts the show. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy this episode of The Gamer's Tavern, and normally this is the point in which I encourage you to leave comments on our website at GamersTavern.org, or on our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash Gamer's Tavern, and I, I, I still encourage you to do so, but I must remind you, edition wars are bullshit. You heard Ross and I disagree for an hour and a half just now. And you've heard episodes we've recorded since this episode where we've gotten along just fine. We're still friends. So please maintain a civil attitude whether you agree or disagree with ourselves or any other commenters. We're all gamers and we all share this hobby whether we differ in opinion or not. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 license. We'd like to thank you once again for joining us, and until next time, the tavern is closed. Have you been looking for a dark fantasy RPG setting? Are you interested in seeing a new take on the action horror genre? Then you should check out Accursed. Accursed is a setting for the Savage Worlds RPG created by me, Ross Watson, and my good friends Jason Marker and John Dunn. It is a world where the heroes are monsters who fight for redemption against the witches who have conquered their land. To find out more about Accursed, search for Accursed on DriveThroughRPG.com. Accursed is now on sale there and in many other fine retailers for gaming PDFs. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoy Accursed.